But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Take us back nearly two years ago, right now almost, take us back two years ago and describe what happened. It was Good Friday and I was actually over your house. Just came over and uh, I remember I had the day off work and just came over to hang out and visit, just kind of talk about softball and just hang out as friends and I remember just sitting there with you and we were talking, having a good time. I think Jay Jeffrey stopped by and uh, Luke stopped by also. And just, I remember as I was sitting there, I was just kind of scratching my neck right here and I felt a pretty big lump. And I didn't want to think too much about it, but you know, I kept feeling that and I was like, ooh, that's, that's pretty big, you know? And then I checked the other side and it wasn't on the other side. And I know that God puts things in pairs. And so that really worried me. And I think I started to get nervous and I kind of left, you know, just real abruptly. And I remember going home and uh, I came home and I uh, was looking for my wife and she was downstairs and I was like, hey, uh, check this out and let me know what you, what you think about this. Should I be going to the doctor? And I had no idea at that time how serious it was. I just knew that there was something there that was not supposed to be there. And uh, so it, anyways, it was Good Friday and just it was real close to five o'clock. So I ended up going to uh, MedPoint. And I went there and I saw the doctor and they were getting ready to close. And uh, he's kind of feeling around and I can see by the look on his face that it was something that he was worried about. And uh, he even told me that, you know, he said it could be a number of things, but you're going to have to go and you're going to have to get some additional tests. And he said, to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm pretty worried about this. And the soonest I can get in, he said, I'll call your doctor and you need to get in first thing Monday morning. And I'm thinking, Ooh, you know, that's, that's not good. So I came home and, uh, you know, doing some self-diagnosis on the internet and I look up, you know, mass in, in neck and uh, it says Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so I started reading about that and I was like, oh my gosh, there's no way. What was your feeling when you saw that? Like you said, oh my gosh. I mean, what was some of the, I, I, know, how, I know how you are. And uh, what was some of the things that were going through your mind when you read that and it kind of matched yeah. the feeling? Yeah, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac. <laughs> Uh, but when I read that, my just my heart kind of sank. You know, I had that sinking feeling in my stomach, like, oh boy, um, and I was worried. So, you know, I went in Monday morning and I had a scan. Um, my mother-in-law was actually the person who did the scan for me, so it was nice to have somebody that was a familiar face to do it with such a serious situation. But um, and the other nice thing was that it was read right on the spot. So I knew before I even left what was going on and uh, the doctor came out, very nice guy, uh, just sat down with me and said, you know, this looks like uh, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma and, um, you know, you're young, you'll do really well. And he was really, really great about it and, and comforting. But, you know, I walked out right there knowing that there was a really good chance that, you know, it was cancer. And the reason he was so certain is because in addition to the mass um, that they found right here, they found a, a large mass that showed up, you know, on the, on the scan in my chest. And that's pretty, you know, textbook what classic Hodgkin's lymphoma is. There's several types of Hodgkin's lymphoma, but that's what my type looked like. When you, when you were told that, uh, the, your, your thoughts, right, when he said that Hodgkin's lymphoma and your wife was right there and your mother-in-law, I'm assuming, was right there as well. So you had two of your family members right there. Um, when he said that, how, how was your reaction? Like, oh my God, this is, this is the end of the world. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Or was it like, oh, you know, I, I know I'm a great person. I'm in great shape. I can beat this. I mean, what was your immediate reaction, your feeling? I think my immediate reaction was, all right, let's do this. You know, um, I, I took my 10 seconds to kind of worry about things and, and feel bad about things. But it, I don't know. It was just, it, it's my reaction. I, I didn't put any thought into it. It was just, here's what it is. Let's go do something about it. You contacted your family. 
uh, came, came home, home called. Pretty much contacted my family. <laughs> uh, I remember you told me, uh, and uh, what was the reaction of your family? I know how I reacted. I know how your friends reacted, but how, how did your family react? And I say pretty much because I didn't tell my sister for a long time. And we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but um, it, was, it, it was a very touchy situation. Um, I had called my brother, and he kind of knew about things from the beginning because he's in the medical field. Um, he actually did all my later scans. But so he had a pretty good idea what was going on and it wasn't a shock to him. So he was okay with it. But I knew my mom was gonna be devastated. So uh, <laughs> I kind of tricked her and invited her over for dinner. And uh, I sat down with her and I told her and she completely flipped out. And she freaked out and said, you're not telling the truth. There's no way this is possible. I mean, complete denial, but you got to imagine that, you know, you're feeling, can you imagine what you, what you would feel like when your child tells you something like that? It's just, it's very difficult, and uh, she didn't handle it well. And uh, my wife was actually not there with me when I found out. It was just my mother-in-law. And I asked her to not tell my wife until, you know, I could tell her personally. Because she was at work, you know, I did this in the morning and I knew that she was gonna be at work. And that's not something you tell somebody while they're at work and have to finish out their day or drive home. So, uh, you know, I, I sat her down on the couch, kind of the same thing and uh, kind of the same reaction. And she was very, very devastated as well. Uh, it's just, I, I can only imagine um, how hard that was. And actually I knew how hard that was because the year before that she was actually having some problems and we thought that she could possibly have cancer. And I remember my reaction to that. And so I, I knew how she felt, you know, it's just very, very tough to deal with. And that's one of the things that you had always told me that you were always more worried about, uh, not only now, but in the past, it's not so much you, it's how other people feel. Right. I think it's because you have no control over the situation. I mean, I have a little bit of control over the situation because I go through it and there's things that I have to do. And so in, in that way, I get to fight it. But no one else around me, no one else can do a single thing to, to fight for me. Um, there's just very, a, a very limited amount that people can do. And when you really care about somebody, that's the toughest thing there is. You have to sit around and watch somebody suffer, sit, some, sit around and watch somebody fight, and you can't really do anything about it. You can support them, but you, you, know, you hear it so often, I wish I could take your pain. And I totally believe that, but they can't. So it's just hard. Okay, let's move, move forward a little bit. Um, they had to start the surgery to be able to remove the mass and everything. Talk about that, going through that, and then tell us about the treatment, which turned out to be the biggest battle of your life, as you told me. Yeah. Well, to make sure, you know, they did the scan and they saw everything and, you know, it was textbook, you know, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, but you have to do a biopsy to make sure. You know, you can't just rely on, on a scan and, and before you treat somebody. So I had to go in and I had to do a surgery to have the, uh, the mass biopsy from my neck. That was the one they can get to the easiest because they didn't, you know, there was no reason to cut my chest open when they can get to this spot. So it was diagnosed and it was classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. And from there I went in and saw my doctor and probably no more than a week after that, I started treatment. I had to surgically have a port put in, which is a device that they can uh, put, into your, put into your body and it hooks into your artery. And then that way they can just deliver the chemo drugs without doing any real damage to your veins or anything like that. Okay, we were talking about your sister and how at first you didn't want to tell her and then uh, you eventually did, of course. And then your sister played a big role in a lot of things in your life now. Yeah. Let's talk a little about that. Well, my sister was living out in LA and she is an actress and model. And she was finally kind of got a, a little bit of a break and got a leading role in a movie. And she was getting close to the end of finishing it. And every day she would call and we would talk, and we, we talked a lot anyways. Um, but she would call and tell me how wonderful, what an amazing experience it is, and this day was the best day of my life, and it's the most amazing thing. And I would say, you know what, this is gonna be the day that I tell her, I have to tell her. You know, it's been two weeks already, and I haven't even given her a clue what's going on. And uh, you know, today would be the day, and then she'd, say, oh, I got to be in a shoot with some live tigers. And I was like, I can't do that to her. 
you know, she's got to finish this thing because I know what kind of person she is. She has a huge heart. She loves me so much and she would completely quit that film and come home. And I knew that. So there's no way I could have told her. But uh, she ended up finding out um, from Facebook. Somebody posted something to her and said, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. I can't believe that's happening. And so she's like, what are you talking about? She calls home and she asks my mom. She's like, uh, I got a weird message today. What's going on with Shane? And my mom says, well, you just need to call your brother. <laughs> so she's freaking out. And then she, uh, she calls me. And I'm kind of busted at that point. So I spilled everything. And uh, like I thought, you know, she was ready to come home right then. You know, she was ready to stop this amazing, huge opportunity that she had to come home and take care of me. And I said, you know what? It would mean a lot more for me if you would just finish this out. You know, I'm going to go through some treatments. I'm going to have some time here. I'll be going through some things for a while. Just finish out your project and then you can come home if you want. She is, oh, she's an amazing person. She has a huge heart. And, you know, between her and my wife, I don't think they missed, you know, any of my treatments. They were there by my side the whole time. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary when you go in the first time and you have those kind of drugs that are going in you. You don't know how you're going to react. You don't know how, if you're, how tired you're going to be, if you're going to be able to drive yourself home. Um, it's just, you know, and I was there for six or seven hours a day when I, when I would do that. So having someone like, you know, my sister and my wife with me the whole time, you know, and we would do all kinds of fun things. I mean, I think really people didn't like us being there because we're in there, we're laughing, we're having a good time. And, you know, it's a, it's a whole room of people that are getting, you know, chemo drugs. And it's not fun. And people get sick, you don't feel well. But really, I don't think you should be having a lot of fun in there. <laughs> and when we're sitting there and we're laughing and we're doing all kinds of uh, little projects and stuff in there, keeping ourselves busy, um, it, it made things much easier for me. But at the same time, people are probably thinking, what's wrong with these people? All right, tell me about the treatment. You talked about having fun in there and everything, but it wasn't all fun and games, was it? No, it really wasn't. Um, I had six rounds of chemotherapy, and each round consisted of two treatments. And I would get that every two weeks. So I would go in there, and I had four different drugs that I took. And it took me about three weeks before I started getting sick. And after that three week mark, I got literally sick, um, you know, vomiting and really bad nausea uh, every week after that. So it really started to not get fun being in there, but we made the best of it. A couple of times throughout the chemo treatment, I remember you telling me that the chemo part is actually worse than anything to do with the cancer. Oh yeah. But when you were taking the chemo, you had told me how it got really bad. At one point, even saying this chemo is far worse than even having cancer. Oh, yeah. Well, even from the beginning, the treatment was far worse than the disease. Um, I, like I said, when I was at your house, I found it by chance. I didn't have any symptoms. I mean, I wasn't... Yeah, I, I mean, I had some fatigue and things, but I don't know if that was from stress or from the actual disease. So, you know, I really didn't have too many signs. It wasn't like I was um, really sick going into it but the treatments they were awful you know that was when i'm talking about getting sick in in the room and and during my my chemo that's just you know the six or seven hours that i was there when i came home it got a lot less fun um i would continue to be nauseous and uh honestly i mean nausea is one of the worst things that there is when it doesn't go away i mean it would take me three full days if not four to five before i can really even eat food I mean, it was just that bad. Um, it, was, it was the most disgusting feeling you can imagine. Um, just as time went on, it really drained me. Um, I got weaker and weaker. There was less and less that I can do. You know, I started out strong and I was able to, you know, do a little bit of exercising. And by the end of it, I couldn't walk from, you know, I had to have a handicap pass. I couldn't walk from, you know, the parking lot to the store. I couldn't walk around in the store. It was too, too tiring for me. I mean, I did things and I pushed myself because, believe it or not, when you're that tired, the only thing that gives you more energy is to maybe walk on a treadmill or something. But at that point, I wasn't jogging. I was walking. And it was, it was a lot to do. Um, it, it made your body... It, 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 it was a lot, a lot of pain. 
um, I had to have shots that I took to boost my immune system because, you know, the chemo tears everything down. It kills your good cells and bad, so your immune system is affected by it. So I'd have these shots, and what it would do is it would boost your white blood cell count. Your white blood cell comes from your bone marrow. So these shots, um, they would make your bones swell so that it would produce more of the good white blood cells to help me fight off infection. And it was very painful. It was... I can't imagine, I can't even imagine what I can compare it to. Maybe the worst case of arthritis you could possibly feel, you know, and, and most people won't feel that till they're old, so they can't even comprehend that. And uh, it, it just all together, just ugh, the combination of everything, it was, it was brutal. It was very, very hard to endure that. About mid-season, uh, mid-season through our softball season, uh, you we're going through the chemo. I think you might have come to a, a stopping point of the chemo and you're starting to get a little bit of your strength back. And we talk about a little bit. I remember we mean it was a very little bit, but you decided to come out and, uh, and play softball for yeah. once for a league night. It was very difficult. Uh, I remember that. And then more importantly was a week or two weeks later, we had the Mishawaka City Tournament and uh, your, your wife was there. Uh, I'm not sure if your wife, I know your sister was there. She was recording. I think we had it on video yeah. somewhere. Um, tell us about what happened. You, you wrote about it in your blogs, and you really took everybody through it on the blog. But uh, talk about that, because I know you had said something about you've been trying all year, <laughs> and you weren't able to do it, right. and then something big happened, and the significance of that meaning. Well, I'll start off with the first league night that I played. I remember that one pretty vividly, because it was the first time I came out and played, and I remember I went 0 for 6. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was in bad shape. And, you know, even if I did get on base, I would have had a pinch runner for me because I don't think, you know, number one, it would have been safe. And number two, I don't know if I could have made it around the bases running around. Uh, but I was still very angry about going 0 for 6 because I felt, you know, it's just I have a lot of fight in me. And uh, even going through all that, feeling the way I did, you know, I just expected more out of myself. So that was, it was kind of funny looking back on that of how can you get mad at yourself for that? But this is who I am. Um, Moving ahead to the city tournament, though, um, one of the most important things for me when, you know, I wanted to get on the field, but one of the most important things for me, and I don't really know why, but I wanted to hit a home run. Get out of here, ball! It's over him, it's over him! Are you freaking joking me? Shane just got a home run? He <laughs> <laughs> just got a home run. <laughs> I think it was because of how much strength I had lost and you know all my power was gone I had I had hardly anything in me it took a lot to just get out to the field and uh, it's just something I really wanted to do I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it um, you know, besides timing and everything like that, I just didn't even know if I had the strength to do it. So I, I came out and, uh, you know, I wasn't even trying to hit a home run that day, but it happened. And uh, I was really excited. I mean, it's on video and you can tell and, you know, I have no emotion on my face or anything like that. But inside, I was pretty excited to do it. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to the exact words you said uh, on your blog that day. Um, and this was right after the situation. In the few games I was able to play this year, I was able to connect with the ball with everything I had and came up 20 to 30 feet short of the fence due to your lack of strength, obviously. Yeah. Now, here's the amazing part and what made the home run even more special to me. It, wasn't, it was important to me. I really wanted to accomplish this to prove I can accomplish even the most difficult things with the right mindset. Yeah, I just think that there's something going through this that motivates me. And I think the underlying theme is... To do things that shouldn't be possible and that's one of the things that just keeps me fighting so hard is that no matter what they tell me no matter how bad it, it sounds or looks I'm gonna prove somebody wrong all right let's go a little bit further now you've got to the point where you had I think you made a big post on on the blog that you've beaten cancer everyone is excited you're feeling great um, your faith has got you through it, but more than anything, you talk about the support of your, your family and friends. And, and I think you, one of your exact lines you said in your blog was, if you had to put uh, a sign, uh, a credit to somebody, it would be all of the people that has, that has uh, followed you and supported you at this point before the next step. Yeah, 
Um, I think, you know, I wrote in there that I thought it saved my life in a way because I have a lot of fight in me and I have a lot of motivation, but it's hard. It's hard to stay positive, you know, extremely positive, extremely full of fight every second of the day. You know, the drugs I had to do, the treatments I had to do, it takes a lot out of you. And to be honest, I don't know if it's possible to just be completely 100%, um, you know, the way I would like to be the whole time. But having the support of people who, you know, every single day, I got a phone call, I got an email, I got a card, you know, I got encouragement from so many places, it would rekindle that fire for me and it would build it up. So if I was having a really bad day and I was really sick, you know, and not feeling well, maybe I got some of those things and it really just brought me back up. So, you know, everybody that took part in this whole journey for me to begin with, the amount of support, the amount of motivation that provided for me, it took, you know, it was just a big part of me beating it at that time. Next step, you beat it. You're rejoicing, you're excited. Then things took a turn. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was uh, quite a shock because we thought everything went so well. You know, I, I did six months of chemo and, uh, you know, it went away after two months. After two months, I was told it was in complete remission. So I went on and did four more months of chemo. And then after that, you know, I was talking to my doctor and he said, you know, I really think that you should do radiation. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm like, why? It's gone. It went away after two months. Why should we do that? And he said, because you did so well that you want to take the extra precautions so that it never comes back. And, you know, I, I went back and forth with should I do that or not, but I did it because I wanted to take every opportunity because, let's face it, it sucked. And that's, I wanted it to be a one-time thing. Shane invited the camera into the hospital so he could see what a chemo treatment is like. Here, um, just take you through a normal day of what happens. First of all, I come in and get some blood work done. Got uh, some blood drawn from my arm here. And they do that just to make sure that all my levels are okay, my white blood cell count's normal. Because if it was too low, that would kind of make things a little bit too dangerous to have the chemo because that's kind of what the chemo does is it, it tears down all those good cells. So if my immune system was too low, they would give me some shots to boost my immune system a little bit and make it more safe to get the drugs. So after I find out that everything's okay with my blood levels, then I come in and I uh, get started on the chemotherapy regimen. That usually means uh, get an IV bag. I start out by getting a saline drip and that's just to get some fluids moving through my body. One of the drugs I get is pretty hard on your kidneys, so I have to have an entire bag of the saline before I can get that drug, just to kind of help flush out the kidneys. And in addition to that, before I start getting the chemotherapy drugs, there's uh, a steroid that I have to take, and that just helps with any kind of reaction that you may have from the chemotherapy. And then I get several anti-nausea drugs, which has always been one of my big problems. So it's not... Um, as bad when I'm here because I have all those drugs. It's kind of when those wear off and I get home, that's the bad part. Um, right now, I'm on my first chemotherapy drug here. And this one's kind of a, a, a painful one because when it goes into your vein, uh, I'm not sure why it does this, but it makes your vein burn. And it's very painful. It feels um, like a bad wasp sting and it's just relentless. So that's why I have a heating pad here on my arm. And it just um, applies some heat to the area. And the reason this helps with the stinging is because the heat makes the blood vessels open up a little bit more. And um, with the blood vessels opened up and a little bit bigger and enlarged, it helps things flow better and takes away some of the burning. Even though she's seen it before, Shane's mother, Rebecca, has a hard time watching her son get the treatment. I don't see a man. I see my child. I see him about seven years old. We built a three houses and <laughs> painting and playing basketball and going on our special days. And when I, when I hold him, He's like sitting on my lap and little, and I just don't see a man. I just see my, my little boy. 
when he was born, they put him on my stomach and God said he's going to be very special and I knew he would. And I didn't know that special was going to be so hard and it's not that. I, I, I know he'll be okay but I don't want to see him go through with this. I can't protect him anymore. And when I came in, I just wanted to take that bag and throw it across the room because it was making him sick. Was the radiation similar to the chemo, or was it worse? Or? Uh, it was not. It was not as bad at all. Um, you know, it just added some fatigue to things. I did it after I was done with the chemo, so I think I did 18 straight treatments. You know, not counting weekends. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't anything like you know when you're getting poisoned so it, it wasn't bad uh, you know it can do some bad things to you later on in life but i you know at that point in my life i just figured it was just extra extra protection so that i wouldn't have to go through this again but it was about let's see five six months later um, i have a follow-up scan every three months for the first year and then after that, you know, things kind of reduce and then you go down to four months, then six, then a year. And then after five years, you're considered uh, completely healed and, you know, it, it's cured. So after these five or six months go by, I have a spot show up. And, you know, I was worried about it a little bit. You know, I, this, this spot shows up, but my doctor says, you know, it's okay. Because this isn't a spot where you've had radiation. He said it could be a scar from radiation. It could be a number of other things. I wouldn't get too worried about it right now. I was a little bit worried still. But, you know, we waited for another three months. And uh, a second spot shows up. And at that point, I'm like, ooh, that's, that's not good. I have two spots showing up now. But I go back to him and he's like, you know what, that spot is also in the area of radiation too. It still could be something. And it's, and it's relatively small. It's, it's not growing fast at that point, very small. And so we have to keep going every three months and go back three months later. Continues to grow, but not by much. I get a second opinion and they're still not all that worried about it. It could still be a lot of other things. But, you know, as time goes on and I keep getting these scans, it keeps growing and that's a problem. So... The main issue is that it was not the spot in my neck, but the spot in my chest. And it was right next to my heart, and that's not an easy place to get to. So we tried about two or three different uh, techniques to try and get a biopsy of this spot. They all failed. Nothing could get to the spot. So I'm left with one option, and that's to have uh, a sternotomy, which is the surgery that you have when you have an open heart surgery. It's when they cut your breastbone apart and spread your chest apart. It's a huge surgery. Something that I wasn't looking forward to doing, something that had a lot of risk to it, something that was gonna put me out for a long time and I wasn't really excited about doing it, but at the same time, um, I really didn't have any other options. I had to find out what this, this was because towards the end it started to grow a lot more and it was very concerning and it was something that we could no longer wait on. Okay, so you're in Indianapolis for this, basically an open heart surgery. Tell us, uh, tell us what happened down there in Indianapolis. A little bit nervous for that one. Big surgery. And uh, I just, I knew it wasn't going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> and got down there, you know, and I, I just knew that it's something that I had to do. I had no other choice but to do this. It's not something that anybody who's 32 should probably have to have any kind of surgery like that. Um, the people that are having those kind of surgeries are a little bit older. So, I mean, I had that going for me and the fact that I'd probably heal a little bit quicker and do a little bit better for the surgery, but it's something that's going to have a uh, long-term effect on me. And, you know, the surgery went well, but I was in a lot of pain. That was a very painful surgery. I mean, it, it sounds painful when you just think about it and what you have to do. I mean, saw through somebody's bone and spread things apart and it's, it was terrible. So they did that, and uh, I think it was, uh, there was a funny thing that happened. While cutting through your, your chest, they broke the saw or something like that? Yeah, I, I guess what happened was something happened to one of the blades. They said uh, I had some very strong bones, and I, I guess from what my family tells me that he, uh, he came out 
and he looked pretty worked over. <laughs> so he was, uh, he, he earned his money that day. <laughs> but it's good to know that I'm not going to have any osteoporosis problems later down the road. <laughs> I got that going for me. All right. So you had the surgery. Uh, now they're going to do a biopsy on the, uh, on the piece that was taken out, correct? Yeah. Did they do that while you were in Indianapolis, or did you have to come home and wait for the result? How was that? It actually all took place while I was in Indianapolis. So they took out several spots. They took out the main spot that was the main area of concern, which was right next to my heart. It ended up that it was a lot larger than they thought it was. How, how large? I mean, you were kind of showing me, and I was down there. How, how big was that piece? Well, on my scans, it, they were kind of calculating it at about close to six centimeters. It ended up being 20. And it, uh, it attached itself to my heart. So that was very shocking. They had to cut it off of my heart. So uh, that was something that nobody expected. And looking back on it, I guess I'm very fortunate that I had that surgery because there's no other way we would have found that out. So I'm very lucky to have actually had that done. And uh, so in addition to that, I had a couple of spots on my lungs that they took. And then while he was in there, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a disease of your lymphatic system, so you have lymph nodes that help, you know, with your immune system. So when those become enlarged, you know, they can become tumors. So he went in there, and anything that looked a little bit large, he took out. So of all the spots, I think he took out five or six spots. Uh, three of them um, tested positive for classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. So basically, your cancer was back again. Yes, it was. It was confirmed, um, and. You asked earlier, how did all that take place? Did it happen while I was down there? I was in the hospital for five days, and uh, I had my brother-in-law come out from California, and uh, he did a wonderful job of being supportive of me, and he actually kind of has a little bit of pull. So I got the ball rolling on some things so that I would find out the results while I was there. And so I think the day before I was released, I actually found out the results and was able to sit down with one of the you know, specialist there and talk with him for uh, about an hour, actually. So it was really wonderful that I got all the results and were able to talk about the next step that was going to have to happen while I was down there. And what was that next step? Uh, he, well, he explained that the next step was going to be a stem cell transplant. And that was not a shock to me because that was something that I asked my doctor here that, you know, if it comes back and the results aren't good, what's the next step? So that was something that, you know, I had a heads up for but I didn't really know what it was going to be involving. You've obviously been involved with the stem cell procedure, and they've told you about this, and you've probably done your own study a little bit more on it and everything. Tell everyone that's watching this exactly what that means. I mean, I guess walk people through what a stem cell okay. uh, surgery is. A couple different types of stem cell transplants that you can do. Um, the one that I'm going to do is called an autogalous stem cell transplant. That means you're your own donor. And that's really important because you're your own donor, so therefore your body is not going to reject any of the cells, whereas if it was the other way around, then you would have a higher um, incidence of something going wrong because your body could reject something that's foreign to it. But with me being my own donor, and I guess I don't know that for sure yet because I had to have a bone marrow um, test again just to make sure things aren't in the bone marrow. I'll find that out later this week. But, you know, as things are right now, I should be my own donor. And um, what happens is I'm going to do a few rounds of uh, chemo here in town before I go to Indianapolis. And the goal of that is to shrink things that may be there to as small as possible so that when I have the stem cell transplant, then it will be, you know, a higher likelihood of success. And what's involved in the transplant? Um, it's very, very high doses of chemotherapy. It's going to kill um, just about every cell in me. It's going to kill everything in my bone marrow. So the importance of me being my donor is because I'm not going to have anything in my bone marrow anymore. There's not going to be anything to repopulate itself. So if they didn't retransplant this back into me, I wouldn't have an immune system. I wouldn't have red blood cells. I wouldn't have white blood cells. So I wouldn't be able to live. Your chemo treatment that they want to do was scheduled for approximately scheduled for several weeks down the road. They wanted to get you completely ready. Um, I mean, when you first came home, not even just coming home from the hospital to here was, was horrible. As you described it, a pillow to your chest, like a typical person that had open heart 
surgery you had, you had you could barely move, walk around, and just as you're starting to get a little bit more of your strength back, we'll talk about a little bit some of the things you did, but you were told that things are going to be moved up. Yes. Yeah, like you said, when I first got home, I couldn't get myself out of a chair. I couldn't lay down on my own, and I certainly couldn't get up. It was uh, it was very painful. Um, one of the other things about the surgery that I didn't mention that may have been almost the worst part, even more so than cutting my chest open, is the chest tubes that they put in. It's to make sure that things um, like fluid, that they, it doesn't build up. It doesn't build up in your lungs. You don't get pneumonia. And these tubes, they put four tubes in me, and they're about that long and very uncomfortable, very painful. And the other bad part about it is they kind of cut your abdominal muscles to get those in. So that's why I couldn't get up. You know, That's why I couldn't sit up or anything like that. So yeah, it was, a, it was a long process. And they just felt that they wanted me to heal up from this major chest surgery before I started treatments. And that's important because of how sick I got when I did chemo last time. I don't know if my chest could handle uh, throwing up right now. I know it really hurt when I sneezed and when I cough. That's very painful, so I can only imagine how it's gonna feel when I would have to get sick. I'm not sure that I will, but there's probably a pretty good chance uh, but I don't have that kind of time anymore. Um, about a week ago, I had a night sweat, a really bad night sweat. So it's not like when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a little bit of sweat on you. It's one of the symptoms that is present for Hodgkin's lymphoma. It means it's growing. It means it's doing its thing. So I don't have time anymore. I don't have time to heal up. I got to start because the goal of this first set of chemo is to make sure that things get as small as possible so it gives me a better chance. Um, when you talk about Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can have A or B symptoms, and uh, B is kind of a bulky disease. And by bulky, you know, we're talking about the size of the tumors that I had in me. We know how big it was the first time. We know the second time it was 20 centimeters. That's huge. And with this growing the way it's growing, I can't afford for that to happen. You know, I'm not sure, but maybe the first time it didn't work because it had to fight off so much. I don't know, it could be, but I just know that they would really feel a lot more comfortable with starting me now, um, you know, and me going through a little bit of pain. You know, my chest will hold up. They have it tied together with titanium, so it's not going anywhere, but it's gonna be really painful if I get sick. On your Facebook page, you have over 600 people that are following you, that are, um, that are seeing what you have to say and stuff, kind of using that as your blog at this time, sort of. And, but more importantly, they're just posting things, saying, hey, Shane, we're behind you and stuff like that. What does that mean to you? It means a great deal to me because a lot of the people are people from my past that I haven't gotten a chance to reconnect with. And now with this happening, it's just, it provides even extra motivation for me because it's people that used to be an important part of my life and maybe they moved away or maybe we kind of grew apart but they're they're coming back and uh, showing their support for me and I even have a a close friend from high school who uh, we were just we were really good friends and we hadn't talked in a while you know the first time I went through it he would send me you know some messages but we really haven't seen each other since then but he's doing something really cool for me. He's actually having a benefit at his restaurant for me. So it's things like that where, you know, just connecting in that way, it just, it, it makes me smile because I know that these people care about me and I remember what a good time I had with them in the past and it just brings back some good memories and that kind of negates some of the bad things that are going on right now. What would you say is something that keeps you motivated? Well, there's a lot that keeps me motivated. Obviously, the support of my family is a huge support. Um, I mean, my mom, sister, wife, brother, they're over almost every single day. Sometimes I have to just kick them out because they're just a little bit too supportive. Uh, but they are with me every step of the way. I have my friends who come out and it's just so important to me, the encouragement that they give me. And it's just, it's great to know that you're important to people. Um, but. The main thing is to fight to stay alive. It's, I have no choice. This is something that I have to give my maximum effort and then some to be able to endure these treatments that I have to go through. And it's, it's not a game anymore. Uh, the stem cell transplant that I have, 50% chance that it's gonna work. That's not that high. But with my attitude and my fight, you know, it's just a statistic. If you knew what you know now five years ago, would anything be different today? 
Would you do anything differently? You know, I look at my life and what I have going on, and I'm not being as productive as I'd like to be. And when I say productive, I'm talking about making a difference for other people, um, making other people happy, because I think that's why we're here. You know, we're here to support each other. And everybody gets to do that with me right now. But I look back and I'm thinking to myself, I've put an awful lot of time into myself and what I like doing and not making sacrifices for other people. We do some great things with Street Kids Care and I do some things besides that and I reach out to people. But when you really start to put things into perspective and you think that your life could be shortened on earth here, you start to think about what did I really accomplish? Did the things I accomplish, were they all for me or were they for other people? And I look back on that and yeah, I enjoy playing softball and, and things like that. And I played an awful lot. I played in the weekends because I love doing it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But at the same time, there's got to be balance for me personally. You know, am I, is that the only thing I might do and that I'm doing? Or am I doing things to make sure that I'm helping other people, that I'm making a difference in life? So you, obviously you think that from five years ago to where you are now, you would do things differently. It just really made me rethink how I'm living my life. Uh, I am an accomplishment-driven, goal-driven person. But when you are driven by goals and accomplishments, usually it's just all things that you want to accomplish for yourself. And that's something that I wish I would have rethought. And it's not something that I intentionally do selfishly. It's just maybe it's an extra degree from school, you know, things like that. You know, things that are good for you, things that better your career. But I guess there's really no way to tell when your life may be cut short. Knowing that that's a possibility, it makes me rethink things. It makes me rethink how I live my life as far as enjoyment goes. I'd uh, spend more quality time with certain people rather than, you know, going out and uh, maybe doing something that was for myself. You know, I'd spend more uh, intimate time with family and friends and maybe go out and see some places that I've never seen and experience more rather than go to work five days a week, come home on the weekend, you know, maybe either play softball or just rest and recover and not do a whole lot and take a few vacations a year. I mean, that's just something that each one of us has to face because it's reality. You know, we have to have an income. We have to provide for our families. But if you know that your life may be on a different track, I think we would live things out differently. I think we would try to make sure that, you know, the people around us are taken care of, that we help other people. You've been asked... People have been, I've contacted you, people that have cancer or be, at the beginning stages of going through treatment. People have contacted you, friends of friends and stuff like that. Um, what would you say to somebody that has cancer? As, as an adult, if adults talking to you like yourself and asking you, what, what, would you, what would you say to them? I would say don't think the worst because you're going to be given statistics and each person is different. Each person is their own person and the way you handle your cancer, the way you fight your fight, has everything to do with how you're gonna end up. I know a lot of people who give up. I've, I've known people personally who have just gone into depression, have gone into a mode where they don't do anything for themselves, they don't try to exercise or get stronger. It's, it's the saddest thing you could ever see is to watch somebody slowly just dwindle away to nothing and, and pass away. And that has a lot to do with your attitude. And the same thing goes with if you're going to fight and you're not going to give up no matter what. It has a lot to do with the success of things. Everybody's different. And just because they give you a, a number, that means nothing. It's all about your attitude. What would you say if that person was a child? That's very different because I don't think children quite understand what they're up against. That's something that... I would almost say more to the parent than I could to the child. It's, it, I think you would just try to reassure a child that you know what they're what they're going through is okay. Or I guess I would just try and take their mind off it, because you know kids are resilient, 
and uh, they they don't know how to not fight and it's just it's a tough battle it's not something that they understand so I don't know that there's anything that I could personally say to a child besides just trying to take their mind off it and I think that's one great thing that we do um, when we go out for some of the street kids care things we do a lot of stuff with the, the children from Memorial that have cancer and you can see that when we spend time with them when the things we do with them it does take away um, their mindset and focus off what they're dealing with and give them some enjoyment so I guess just taking their mind off things. At the banquet you were um you were given the award. You won the award for the um, Humanitarian of the Year Award, well deserved. And when you got up there, you talked about Carter Wright, who we went out and saw and gave some, uh, some nice gifts to. That moved you emotionally at the banquet. Tell me why. It's sad to see a child have to go through what I went through. It's just, it's heartbreaking because they have no idea what's going on. They have no idea why they can't be a kid. They can't go play Little League. They maybe lost their hair, they look different. And when you're a kid, that's really important because kids are mean. And it's so unfair for that to happen to a kid. And the other thing that breaks my heart is the parents. I know how my mom reacted. And I can only imagine if you have a small child, there's no explanation. You can't figure out why that's happened to your child. It's way more devastating than an adult having cancer. You are a very optimistic person. You are a very smart person. Yet you're given numbers. You're given straight up scientific numbers. We sat here in this room for two hours uh, a week ago and talked about how this could come out. There is a possibility things might not go the way that we all want them to go. Tell me about that. It was very hard for me at first, and uh, I thought about it a lot. And it was mainly hard for me because when your life's down to a coin flip, statistically speaking, that puts things into a whole new perspective for you. You know, you start questioning. I'm a man of great faith. You can't earn your way into heaven. There's no amount of work that you can do, no amount of good deeds that you can do to earn your way into heaven. But at the same time, you are put here to do some difference, you know, making. And you start to question when it's your time and you get up there and you have to face the big guy and you have to explain yourself of, you know, how come I decided to sit down and, and watch TV for three straight days instead of going out to, to help people when maybe they called me and asked me to help them out or something like that? And you start to think about things differently. But the more I thought about things, the more my fight came back. And the more 50% doesn't mean anything to me. I could really care less about it. It is a statistic and I am a person. And I have a lot of fight in me, and to be honest with you, TJ, whether it works or not, I don't expect to go anywhere. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And I think even if this thing doesn't work, I, I told you earlier, I'm big on doing things that shouldn't be possible, and if I go through this and it doesn't work, and they say, you have this long, I will prove them wrong. I will go on an awful long time. And I'd be surprised if it doesn't turn out good for me. One way or the other, I just, I don't expect to go anywhere because I just have a lot of heart and I'll do what it takes. When I was down at IU and they told me my news and everything that was going on, my family was devastated. And for me, it wasn't a complete shock because as time went on, it, it painted a clearer picture of what was really happening inside me. To me, the chances of it coming back, the biopsy of it coming back as non-cancerous was pretty low. I mean, I still had a positive outlook. I still expected it to come back as negative, but it wasn't. But when I heard it for sure that it was back and I knew what the prognosis was and I knew everything about it, 
to be honest, it just fired me up. And one of the things that it did, and you know, I've said this earlier, and you kind of rethink your life and, and the purpose for it. And one thing I thought about was, no matter how this thing turns out, I want to make sure that I'm making a difference, whether I'm here or not. And we came up with the idea of the Shane Varga Foundation. And that's something that we thought about. We thought about, you know, my family is down there supporting me. And I was off work for six weeks. You know, I'm continuing to be off work. It gets expensive. You have medical bills. You have the bills of someone, you know, your family basically staying down there, staying in a hotel to eat. It gets expensive. So I thought, you know, one thing I would like to do is help out other people that are in my situation. So when we were thinking about the Shane Varga Foundation, it's not about me and helping me out. It's going to be something that in time when I am ready to launch this, that it's going to help other people out and hopefully make a difference for them. You know, because like I said, maybe the family who, who goes down there, they would have had support, but the family can't afford to go down there for a week. So you don't have your support system. And I want to make sure that that's not an issue for people. I want to make sure that the people who can't work and they're not getting paid, that, you know, they can provide some possibly income for them or just help with their medical bills because there's a lot of people who are in bad situations, CJ. They can't afford this. It's expensive. And it's just something that hits close to home to me and something that I feel that, you know, because it's something that I'm going through and that I've gone through that I can help other people with. Well, this has obviously been quite a battle for the last two years, uh, all the, uh, your teammates, your friends, your family. Um, but the person that's obviously stood by you the most you know, is your wife. And she's been right there by your side every step of the way. And uh, what, would, what would you want to say to your wife? I'm sure you say it a lot to her, but just something you want to tell her for just, and obviously doing what, what, our, what our wives do for us and everything. Yeah. What I would tell her, I don't know that she would do, and that's, don't worry. Because the poor thing, I know she worries, and I would too. It's a sickening feeling, but, you know, I just want her to know that I'm not going to leave her like that. You know, and... Uh, as much as she can worry, just know that I will do my best to make sure that this comes out good. And just thank you so much for being completely amazing. I mean, she's had to be the woman of the house and the man of the house, you know, through this whole thing. And that's hard. It's hard when you work and she has a tough job. She's got a lot of stress and that I'm proud of her because it's not easy to have to balance all that and do it with a smile and do it without complaining and just to be so strong because that's what I need. I don't need to be around negative people and she's not. She just plows through it like I plow through things and uh, it's just awesome. And that kind of support is really, you know, what gets me through it. Finally, what is something you'd want to say to all the people that are constantly following you? I know we touched about it a little bit earlier, but uh, people are always, I mean, this is something they're waiting to see for a long time, but you know, people are obviously praying for you and uh, being extremely supportive. What did you want to say to them? The obvious thing would be thank you, but I think the, the main thing I would want people to, to hear from me is learn something from me. You know, maybe you see something that I'm doing that could be better, learn something from that. Do it differently than me. Maybe you see me fighting in a way that, you know, is inspiring. Learn something from me. Apply it to your own life. We're all facing things. It doesn't have to be cancer. It doesn't have to be medical. It could be personal things. So, you know, what we deal with every day has a lot to do with how we decide to handle those situations. And. You know, I, I think I'm handling mine in a way where I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stay positive about it. And even though I may not be in the best physical shape or mental shape, I'm still going to try and help people. And I just, 
would tell people to make sure that you're looking out for those people that are close to you and just looking out for people maybe you don't even know and to make a difference.